right. Um, is that big enough or? Let's try to do full screen. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay, so I'll be talking about Drupal and MongoDB. And, well, I'll basically be going over a very high level overview of what MongoDB is and why you should think about it if you're thinking about high performance. Um, what the pros are, what the cons are, um, what is there for Drupal right now, and hopefully what will be there for Drupal in the future. Um, and I'll also go through a demo, and hopefully I'll be able to answer any questions that you have if, if there are any. And if you already know about Mongo, then um, don't ask any questions. <laughs> so, you know, if you're, if you're setting up a Drupal site right now, more likely than not, you're setting up with a reg, you know a regular database like SQL Server or MySQL or Postgres or you know something traditional. And you might be wondering if I'm talking about MongoDB, well, what's wrong with them? Well, there isn't really all that much that's wrong with them. They're they're for most cases they're perfectly fine. But think about it in terms of you know once you have any sort of related data like let's say users and nodes and you want to try and get something um, relational about them, you need to join them. And, you know, in those kinds of cases, or let's say in the case of fields, you have all these individual field tables that are now being made by Drupal 7 that needs to get joined in. And sometimes indexing doesn't work very well. Um, you might have to introduce denormalization, or in the cases of fields, anytime you add a new one, you're going to be building an extra table. And let's say down the line you realize, well, one of these fields needs to get its schema changed. Like in the case with images, the alt, uh, the length of the alt column isn't long enough. Well, it can lock data down, or it can introduce other problems, because it can either mean downtime on your system, or if you're not bringing it down, it's going to result in a spike on your system while it's trying to um, change up that schema. And because your code changes are not automatically coupled with the schema changes, coordination can be difficult. Like I mentioned regarding the, alt, uh, the length of the alt text. Just because you've now changed it in code, you also have to change it in the, at the database layer. So you just have to make sure that all of those changes are accounted for. So, well, what is Mongo? Um, well, it's what's called a document-oriented database system. It's written in C++, and it was released by 10Gen in 2009. When you look at the query results, or when you're actually inserting data into Mongo, it kind of looks like JSON. So, you know, you can kind of see this array structure already there, and that's what you're putting into Mongo. And when you get it back, you're getting it back in this array structure as well. So, you know, when you're really thinking about it, when you're building out all these PHP arrays, it kind of maps relatively well in the structure. And now when you start to think about databases that they have, instead of thinking about the different tables that are in there, you're thinking more about collections that they have inside it. And these collections consist of individual objects or documents. And then when you look at, you know, the command line queries, well, they're kind of similar to SQL, except they're also kind of not. Um, you know, instead of doing select whatever from node, you have something like database dot fields in the node, find everything that has a user ID of zero, and the field name value exists. Or find the node that has an ID of 100. Or what this, or what Mongo also allows you to do is regex searches. So you can search for any node that has a title which contains the word title in it somewhere. You can do it in MySQL as well, but it's not really optimized for it, and Mongo is. And if you want to save something, then you just do, you know, whatever your collection is, and save this JSONified node object that you have. Or if you want to remove something, you just provide it a set of parameters uh, that it should match to remove all the things that are in there. So, Again, why would I use it? It's okay, so it's a document. What makes it what makes it great? Well, A, it's highly available. It's fairly easily scalable, i.e. you can basically just add a new machine into the configuration 
um, and provided that your configuration files are okay, it will automatically start um, distributing whatever sharding or the load across them that you have. It's uh, tolerant and most importantly, it's tableless and schemaless. And since you're storing an entire object into this collection, since you're doing it in one go as opposed to doing it to each of these different tables, like let's say if you have it for fields, which I'll keep repeating again and again, it can become faster. So someone had posted stats, and this was regarding whitehouse.gov. Um, they have this direct engagement um, area where people can do propose, like, propose different things and whatnot. And uh, they basically average about 15,000 uh, requests per day, like uh, people posting in something new. And at the time, they had 2 million records in their database. And this was equaling about 4 gigs of data. Uh, when you start getting into those kinds of numbers, I mean, you know, 4 gigs isn't a whole lot of data, but it kind of is as well. And replication issues within MySQL or in some of the other uh, types of uh, relational database systems can start to occur. So they decided, okay, let's try switching to MongoDB. As I mentioned, it's relatively easy. Like, you can do replication or you can do sharding based on different sets of columns of data that you might have. And now they're serving well over 180 million um, documents in their collection. I should have said documents and collections of collections and collection. That doesn't make sense. But anyways, it's a huge amount of data that they're serving. And, um, you know, people are getting data access back from. And it's still very fast. So, you know, it has a whole lot of good things going on for it, but it also has some downsides. You know, it says queryless, but I mean, you're still putting it into a format that kind of looks like a query. And you still have to format it so that it works efficiently. Um, just as an example, like if you wanted to do range queries or sort queries, uh, you're that range portion of it, or the sort, has to be the last, uh, last column in your index. If it isn't, then it won't utilize the indexes, uh, indices uh, correctly. And as of March from last year, it did have a limit of 64 indexes per collection. So if you have a collection that has lots and lots and lots of fields, then you might be hitting that limit. The other parts would be, you know, since it isn't, a relational database, you can't really join across different tables of data or different documents, list, or sorry, or different collections of data. And thus, you can't really filter based on data that might be in these two different things. So let's say you're looking up a user that has a birthday on, certain, on some other date. If your birthdays are in one collection and your users are in another collection, you can't really do that it makes more sense for the user's collection itself to hold that birth date, and then you can do all of that kind of filtering or querying against it. So, you know, we have all of this, and there is actually a MongoDB module that kind of tries to, or doesn't kind of try to, it, it does a very good job of storing data in the right places, wherever possible. Um, there's the MongoDB core library, so this is something that you would use if you were deciding to write your own queries or write something to Mongo yourself. You can use their API and it'll do all of the things for you. Uh, there's the MongoDB block module, which will allow you to store your blocks in Mongo. Uh, you can use the MongoDB cache or the session, so you can store caches and sessions and watchdog all in Mongo. And the biggest part is there's the MongoDB field storage, which will actually allow you to store uh, pretty much all of your node data in Mongo. And, you know, so if you look at the MongoDB core, if you were to write code, you'd have something like collection is equal to MongoDB collection, and then you just give it the name of whatever it is. And you don't have to worry about whether or not this collection actually exists in the MongoDB backend. Once you save something to it, it'll be created for you automatically. So again, this is this idea of schema-less. It doesn't matter. It'll just, it'll make it for you. And if you wanted to find one particular item, like let's say if I was giving it the particular ID, you just use find one. Or you can use find and give it an array, 
uh, an arrayified kind of, uh, you know, um, conditions. Or you can have remove to be able to remove any particular piece of content or any parameters that fit it. And you can save a document to the collection. So, you know, in the same way, like I mentioned, you'd have that JSON, JSONified object. You'd have the same kind of thing here. And that's really it. Uh, yes, Pete? Um, I just want to be clear, it probably works this way, but when you do a search on mm -hmm. a criteria like ID, mm -hmm. that has to be a key inside of the array that was stored? Yes. So any key name in the stored array can be searched on? Yes. And you can actually have compound indexes as well. So you can have a key that's referencing a key that has a set of values to it. So like a collection of fields, let's say. Or, sorry, uh, let's say you had a name field that consists of a last name, column, a first name, column, and a middle initial column. You could have, you know, your node, you could have, which is, ref which is itself the key, which is the ID key, which is referencing the name field, which is a key, which is then referencing the individual last name, first name, and middle initial um, keys with their values. So then you just kind of uh, compound it together to be able to drill in and figure out, find what you want to find. And do you have to set up those search keys, indexes ahead of time? Um, the MongoDB module is actually fairly good about it and it'll do it for you automatically. Based, because of the fact that it's and it's looking at an initial schema that's already there for the fields. It's able to see that these are the fields that are supposed to be indexed for it. So that's why it'll make those indices for you when it's, uh, when it's saving that data. And like I mentioned, there's the MongoDB watchdog, which will, which will put much lower strain on your database server. Like it's very useful if you have a lot of activity on your site and when I meant good or bad, by bad I meant if you had a lot of PHP notices or things like that happening on your server on every page, um, sometimes uh, the relational database can get bogged down in it. And the MongoDB watchdog is, it's just much more efficient with dealing with those things. Um, you can also cap a collection size. So, you know, in, in the case of watchdog, like I said, if you have all of these PHP notices or whatever happening on each page load, you could end up with, you know, going from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of things in there. By capping it, you're basically limiting its size off. So anything that else that comes above it, it'll just throw it away. You can also quickly purge it out. And the best part is, provided that you have MongoDB already up and running, you just need to enable that module and you're ready to go. Um, with caching and sessions, uh, you just have to add one of these two one of these two lines or both of these lines into your settings.php file and it's basically just referencing where to find the particular mongodb cache.inc file or the session.inc file include. And in the case of caching, since uh, Drupal 7 allows for pluggable caching layers, uh, you, can, you would then just say, make my default cache for all of my tables equal to Drupal mongodb cache. And then you could specify any other ta specific tables to use any other kind of caching that you wanted to. Like let's say if you wanted to use memcache, that might, that might be your default one. And then for something else, it might be the Mongo. Um, from what I've heard from other people though, sessions is the area where it's more likely to be helpful. Whereas with the caching, you might be better off placing your efforts in using APC or memcache. Um, since it'll get stored directly into memory, so it, it should end up being faster that way. And field storage, that's, that's really the, the gem that's inside the MongoDB module. Uh, what you would do is you would enable the MongoDB field storage module, and then you would put um, your configuration field storage default to be equal to MongoDB field storage. And what this will do is any new fields that you create, it will store any of the data that's going to be going in for them into MongoDB as opposed to inside your database. And like I said, 
because it's now storing everything as a document, uh, there's faster saving, faster deletion. Um, depending on how you're looking at it, there's faster node retrieval, though I found that relatively comparable. But it's mainly the saving and deletion where things get, uh, where this really shines. Um, it's fully compatible with entity field queries. Now, does anyone know what enti entity field queries are in Drupal? I see one hand. Think of it as a, DD, as a DB query, except this is a query against any kind of entity. So you can basically say, show me any, get me any entities that match, let's say, a entity type of node with a bundle of story with this, with the name field's first name equal to Ashok. And then it'll pass, pass back to you all of the node IDs that match it. Uh, and that's how it'll just build out the query. And MongoDB is fully compatible with it. So instead of doing queries against your database, it'll just be doing those queries against Mongo. It also ha doesn't have any limits on field lengths. So um, some of you know I've been working on the image alt length issue. That's why I mentioned it a couple of times. Uh, if you're using something like Mongo, you don't really have to worry about it. You can have it go on for as long as you want. Um, and finally, there's actually a project called Entity Field Query Views, which, even though it's not fully fleshed out yet, and it could probably use some help for people that understand Mongo more, um, it offers some views integration with Mongo. So you can start building out your site using Mongo, and then you can use views. That, that sounds pretty damn awesome to me. And that's the end of my presentation part of things, and I'll just... So, I have two different sites. They're basically the. Oh, Christopher. I just had a question on, when you're open for questions. I'll... Oh no, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so you mentioned the field storage module and the watchdog module, uh, or Mongo DB watchdog module. Do these import from your MySQL or Maria database into Mongo with the Trendmon, or does it only save new stuff that is added or generated? With the field, in both cases, you have to import it into MongoDB. Now there are a couple of people that have written some scripts that'll do it for you automatically, but the other part that you have to factor into all of this is there is a field config table in MySQL, and in that it says which module it uses for the field storage. So you have to make sure that you convert any of the field, or you just have to change the value in there from being SQL storage to being MongoDB storage. And then any of the fields that are referenced will now start storing in MongoDB as well. So it's, it's two things that you have to do. You can do a node load, so you get all of your nodes, and then you do a nodes, and then you just do a, then you would just implement that uh, particular, let's see. Right, so you would do your node load, and then you would do a collection save with that particular node data. So then that way it's now being stored in um, a MongoDB collection at that point. So once you have that running, then you're you pretty much migrated over. And what about uh, watchdog data? Watchdog data, you could do the same kind of thing. You would just you would just read each value that's currently there in the table, and then you would save it into your collection after that point. So then that one's a much easier process. You don't have to do too much more than that, other than disabling DB log and then uh, making sure that uh, the watch or sorry. MongoDB watchdog is enabled. Have you, um, have you done any digging? Like, is the how's the write performance for Mongo compared to, uh, like, you know, MySQL or something? We'll go through it right now. Okay. Hopefully, it cooperates me with me well. <laughs> but at the very least, I found it to be at least twice as fast, if not more. Um, same goes with deletion, and. The biggest thing that I found in both of these cases is that um, I have all the queries coming out at the bottom and right now, just so you have an idea, I'm running it with Solar and Memcache. One side has a regular database storage and the other has Mongo. So this way, oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry, are you using eventually consistent writes to it? Pardon? The uh, writes, are they, cons they eventually consistent? In other words, the asynchronous style writes where you can lose some data or are you forcing synchronous writes on 
Right now, it's it is. The asynchronous, I believe. Yes. Which so. I, I'm sure you can get a lot of right performance out of it. It's just yes, there is the potential to lose data. So it isn't asset compliant. So that's something else to keep in mind as well. But for the most part, it's, it's literally it's a one in a data. million kind of chance that you might lose data. The only reason I mentioned that is I started to try to do the, 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 the secret rights and it was a huge performance penalty. It was just, right. It was yes. almost not worth doing that mm -hmm. way. Uh, right. We found the same thing. Anyway. I've read the same, same things as well. Um, yes? Do you consider a one in a million chance of losing data negligible? <laughs> Depends on the kind of data. And depends on what you're losing. I mean, if it's a watchdog thing that you're losing, it's a, log. it's a log. Unless it's the kind of log that says your site is completely screwed at this point. Please read this log unless you want to lose everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, anyways. Um, Shouldn't have made it that big. Okay. So page again. And just so you get an idea, on a regular node, this is showing about 50 nodes at this point. We have 10 queries and it takes about 137 milliseconds. And this is on a regular page. And the peak memory is 9.75 megs. With this, it should amount to be about the same. So now if we're looking at it, there are 11 queries. Uh, the page execution time is a little bit lower, but the PHP peak is almost 2 megs lower. And what you would also find is that if you start going to, let's say, different pages, depending on the page that you're on, or depending on the node that you're looking at, PHP does a, or sorry, Drupal does a lot of caching of the data that it's re retrieving from the field storage. So it's doing queries against those, building them up, and then caching it all up for you, for later use. So you can see some pages will start getting a higher load. In this case, I'm having pages that are wholly uncached, except for you know, certain things that do get cached. And with Mongo, since it's already retrieving that particular document for you, it doesn't have to perform all those queries again and again. It's, it's very consistent in, in the number of queries that will happen from page to page. Oh, dear. No, my battery's dying, so I have nine minutes. Oh, thanks. So I'm logged in, and what I want to do now is, I don't know, I want to create a whole bunch of different nodes at this point. So I'm going to generate some content. Uh, in Mongo, let's say I want to generate 500 or so nodes. probably time it a little bit better, but anyways, oops. Okay, well, that one was pretty much done at this point, and this is not. <laughs> Um, there is a considerable difference in speed in terms of just explicitly writing out new content into your site. And this is the same case with deletion and anything else that happens as well. So, like I said, there's, there's considerable difference in terms of speed for inserting content, and that's where, and that's where it shines. The other area where 
it's great is when you're, let's say you're updating a piece of content with new data on every page load that might be happening on your site, like let's say statistics or, or whatever else that there might be. Um, because these fields are constantly getting updated, you can't really utilize the field storage cache with these nodes. Whereas with Mongo, it's storing it in and then it's coming right back out again. It doesn't have to do all of that processing over and over again. And that's why you have big sites like the Examiner um, running Drupal with MongoDB and having their pages wholly uncached and serving it to millions of users without, um, without those kinds of penalties. And I think that's, that's really it. Uh, I could show you know, deletion and we could kind of sit through and see how long that takes, but I mean, you get the point at this, at this stage. So, yes, Pete? Is this for Drupal 7? Yes. There is a Drupal, there is a Mongo module for Drupal 6 as well, but since there is no field storage in Drupal 6, there isn't that same kind of module for Drupal 6. There are two ways to make fields in Drupal 7, uh, one through the GUI interface and one through a module. Mm -hmm. support both types of fields? Yep. Yeah, so if you don't specify what type of field storage you're using when you're creating the field, it'll just create it using whatever your default is. And in this case, since you state that your default uh, storage method for fields is MongoDB, it'll utilize that. If you want to simulate a join, uh, does that mean you have to store duplicate field values? Yes. That would be one way, or you get your collection, and then you get some set of data from it, and then you can join again, and then get your data from the other one. It, it doesn't quite work well in that way. So your document needs to be... The more data that your document can have that it can search against, that it can search against that particular thing itself, the better it is. Okay, so an example might be with, okay, so the question is, what can't I do with MongoDB that I could do with a relational database with Drupal? Or if I use MongoDB to score my fields, mm -hmm. what will I no longer be able to do with Drupal? Mm -hmm. So I mean, one thing might be references, let's say. So if I have one piece of content that's referencing another type of content, um, one thing that people would generally do is, you know, if they're using views, they have, they have node X joins with node Y on this particular relation, and then it starts displaying data from both things. In this case, you can't really do that because there is no real join. You'd have, you have one collection, you get this set of data, you can then query the other one to get this other data, you might be able to just try and get some overlap and then do things with it, but again, like I said, it's not the most optimal way to be working with it. Ideally, what you... Yes? Ide in other ways, what you might be able to do is whatever data is stored in that other node, you could bring into the original one, so then you can kind of try and sift your way through that to be able to you know, then do whatever filters or things like that against it. And then you can then you have the full set of data to work against. But yeah. You can just run into a rat's list of dozen of questions that I have here. Okay. Um, you mentioned views, and I know Mongo only handles certain tables, i.e. the other tables in Drupal still have to be handled through MySQL. Yes. So the views then if you're going to do a join, you can't join Mongo data with MySQL data. You cannot, no. But, okay. It's, again, like I said, it's, part of this is a limitation of how Drupal 7 is implemented in that you cannot store everything in Mongo to be able to try and do this kind of stuff. Um, part of the hopes with the performance team uh, for Drupal 8 is that it will be able to work with NoSQL or with SQL databases wholly. 
and at least when I talked with Chex last year, um, he, his hope with Pressflow for 7 is that um, it would be optimized towards using NoSQL database, uh, NoSQL databases, so using a combination of Cassandra and Mongo for handling your site as opposed to using uh, SQL storage for all these things. Um, yes? Uh -huh. I want to roll my continue. Um, in Mongo, you can turn off, say for example, storage of certain fields, mm -hmm. like fields, so it's no longer stored in Mongo, but it's stored in MySQL. Yes. Uh, you could specify for a particular field to be using the other storage. Oh, on a field name basis? Yeah. So then that way, like if, let's say if you're creating those fields programmatically, um, when you define that field out, you can say seek, uh, storage is equal to field SQL storage. So then that will make sure that that particular field is stored um, in the database as yeah. opposed to in Mongo. Done in settings.php? No, you don't have to do that in settings.php. So there's um, a GUI interface? I'll have to look into that some more, but most of the stuff that I've seen, like most of the examples that I've seen and that I've worked with, it's been with making the fields programmatically. Um, mm -hmm. Just more control and yada, yada, yada. But like I said, since that allows you to specify what your storage method is going to be on a per field basis, you can then say, okay, store this field in Mongo and store Y field in the database because I know I might be doing joins against that instead. Mm -hmm. Yes? I'm just going to make, a, it, it doesn't exist today, but I'm, I'm playing around a little bit with something called material. <coughs> Okay. And David Strauss is one of the guys who started that a couple of years ago. And the idea is really to be able to programmatically pull together data from different tables into a materialized table so that you're not doing table joins and you're just querying against one table. It's not always 100% updated, but it gets rid of a lot of joins. I thought something doesn't exist, but I thought a really interesting application of MongoDB mm -hmm. would be to change the back end for the materialized right. model to be able to pull data out of your SQL and just slam it into. Right. Just an idea. Well, well, actually, with this site, even though it's a demo site, what I ended up doing was I used Search API. Mm -hmm. I gathered all of my data, and then because Search API technically allows you to choose any search backend that's that you know someone has implemented something for, like Solar or Mongo or whatever it is. Since all of that stuff can get indexed off, then you can just pass it into Search API and its indexing, and then I use views to get that to power it using that. So, you know, there are ways to be able to get around it. Like, like you mentioned, that that's, that's exactly important. yeah, it works. <coughs> it absolutely works. So, yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? Drupal eight. MongoDB support for Drupal 8. Drupal 8's looking good. <laughs> <laughs> they've released something or? Pardon? Have they released a module for Drupal 8, do you know? No, there is nothing for Drupal 8 mm. yet at this point. I don't know if there are any modules at this point. There probably are. The nutcases always make something. <laughs> but, um, hey, hey. I'm talking about myself too. Oh, okay. But anyways, <laughs> besides the point. Um, because the API is changing so much at this point, it, you really have to be paying atten very close attention to what's happening in D8. And that's what I mean by nutcases. I don't mean that in a bad way, but you know. Someone that's actively participating in Drupal 8 in a particular area, they, could, they, would, they might be the ones that are making modules right now. And Mongo isn't one of those at the moment. I heard a rumor that read it in several places that Mongo's making modifications every week It's mm -hmm. a well-maintained module. Is that true? The MongoDB module for Drupal? Yeah. Or, no, it's not. It's, there yeah. are fixes that go up for it, but it isn't that frequent. Yeah, I understood that they're going to be extending it further over time mm -hmm. and include other tables that it doesn't currently include. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's well, what I mean. Like you just told me what the frequency is. Thanks. Yeah. 
Okay, then I guess that's it. Thank you.